Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hi guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I do a show us your portfolio discussion with Gary Antonacci, author of Dual Momentum Investing and widely followed expert on momentum investing in general. We talk to Gary about his personal investment strategy, which follows the momentum models he has created on equities and the fixed income markets. He explains how this system manages his personal investments with discipline and rigor and why the long-term risk and return statistics back up this approach. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Optimal Momentum's Gary Antonacci. Hi, Gary. Thank you very much for joining us again on Excess Returns. Oh, my pleasure. Always happy to join you guys. Today, we're going to talk about your personal investing approach and how the use of momentum sort of sits at the center of your own personal investment strategy. Um, And I think to some extent how some of your models have uh, been enhanced um, with some of the things that you're doing. And we'll sort of get into that. That's going to be the the, the meat of the, the episode. But we always like to start out with some higher level questions just to kind of put your situation in context and help our listeners get an understanding of sort of where you're at with your own investment goals and objectives. And so, you know, maybe to start, the first question we always like to ask is, you know, what for you personally in your portfolio, what are your biggest long-term goals that you're trying to accomplish with it? Well, uh, I, I, uh, I successfully managed hedge funds back in the 80s and accumulated some capital after it was bought out by a brokerage firm. So I've always been on the lookout for, you know, an ideal type of investment. Um, And to me, that meant thinking outside the box, you know, because um, I don't think what's being done by uh, the investment industry generally makes a lot of sense. Uh, It's it's suboptimal to my way of thinking. So I've always kept an eye on what was going on, uh, particularly in the academic side, because uh, they do more thorough research there. And um, so that when I stumbled across momentum about 12 years ago, and uh, the idea was to generate as, as good a return as I could while minimizing uh, the downside. So that's been my objective all along. And I, I have a, a set of tools now. Dual momentum is, is a good part of that, but I have other uh, things now that uh, have allowed me to meet the goals that I've set for myself. Is the purpose of your portfolio to fund a nice retirement? Do you want to have the flexibility to travel? I mean, do you want to leave it to your children? I don't know if you have any children. We, we've never talked about that, but maybe you do. But what 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 are your what's the main goal for the port the investments? Well, most of my uh, net worth is going to be going to charity upon my demise. So that gives me kind of a uh, incentive, you know, to do well that some people might not have who are, uh, I mean, everybody wants to do well, but uh, I feel like, you know, I'll be doing some good uh, as well as doing well. And uh, I'm fascinated, always been fascinated by the markets because uh, not only are there macro issues, but uh, the markets are a laboratory of uh, human thought and emotion. So uh, it's all there's always something interesting uh, going on there, and there there are always new challenges and things to think about. So I do it for a mental stimulation too, and and to uh, you know to beat the markets. There's some psychic satisfi- sa- satisfaction for from being able to beat the markets and for helping other people too who want to take the time to try to understand and appreciate what I'm doing. Do you ever see yourself retiring or do you see yourself doing this for as long as you're mentally capable of? I don't see myself ever fully retiring because uh, I enjoy what I do. Now, I have structured my business in such a way that um, it doesn't take uh, the kind of attention that uh, other people might have to give it because uh, I basically license my uh, signals to uh, a group of advisors who go out and do the day-to-day stuff of uh, handling uh, customer accounts. I also have some family offices and hedge funds. 
so, uh, really sophisticated, substantial investors who uh, I don't have to hold their hand. So uh, basically, it just allows me to do research and a little bit of writing, which is what I enjoy doing. So there's no reason for me not to ever do that. Before we talk about your portfolio, I want to take a step back and talk about the principles a little bit. Can I'm sure some of the people who are listening have, listened, have read your book, but others probably have not. So can, can you introduce the concept of dual momentum and how it works? Well, first of all, you have to understand momentum. Momentum means uh, persistence and performance. So things that have done well tend to continue doing well. And um, that's nothing new. Uh, back in 1937, Cowles and Jones did a study where they uh, put stocks into deciles based on how they performed the previous year. And they found that they continued to perform along the same lines going forward. And then people have looked at relative strength for a long time. Um, that's basically what uh, relative momentum is, is comparing the strength of one asset to others and then going with the strongest ones. Now, there's a second part of that, uh, which I call absolute momentum. Um, I, uh, I introduced people to that in my uh, in a kind of a roundabout way in my uh, first momentum uh, research paper by saying, okay, here's different categories and we'll pick whichever in each category is stronger. But if neither of them outper has outperformed T-bills during our look back period, we'll just, you know, stay in cash or liquid. So that's absolute momentum. You have to have a trend going in your direction with the individual asset, as well as having relative strength versus other assets. And since then, I've discovered that there's a, a great synergy by combining other things with dual momentum, which is something that I, I don't, I haven't seen other people do. We're going to talk about the synergies when we talk about some of your models, but at a high level first, in terms of the asset classes we would find in your portfolio that you're applying momentum to, I mean, are, is it primarily stocks and bonds or do you, do you get a lot broader than that in terms of the assets you consider? Uh, we're broader than that, but I, I tend to want to be in stocks as much as possible if the trend is there, because uh, historically they've had the, uh, the best risk premium. But I found that dual momentum works ex very, very well when applied to uh, fixed income. And we also incorporate uh, commodities and managed futures into our models uh, when they qualify according to dual momentum. Um, it's important, I think, uh, that uh, we apply that kind of a filter to them because otherwise uh, they can create a drag on performance just like uh, bonds can. I want to talk about your advanced global equities momentum strategy, which is what you use now. But before we do that, I want to take a step back and talk about the basic one, which was in your book. Can you just talk about the global mom equities momentum strategy and sort of what goes into that? I was trying to come up with a simple model for the public, for smaller type investors who, uh, you know, were concerned about the market and didn't have a clue what to do, some, some of them. So I presented an approach that uh, hopefully will protect them from severe, uh, extreme, uh, adverse market action and give them a chance to earn a, a better than market return. And I wanted to keep it very simple. So um, I basically said, OK, let's first look at whether uh, stocks are going up or down. That's absolute momentum. Academics call it time series momentum. So if they've been going up over, say, the past year, then we want to be in stocks. If they haven't been going up, then we want to be in something safer like short or intermediate term bonds or T-bills. So once we determine whether to be in stocks or not to be in stocks, then we have to decide what kind of stocks do we want to be in. And my research showed that the best way to apply momentum is uh, applying it uh, globally in terms of whether to be in uh, different uh, stock market indices around the world. In other words, geographic diversification. Um, and then uh, Geksky and Samanov came up with a paper going all the way back to the year 1800, looking at momentum in all different categories. And they found the same thing that applying it to geographically diversified stock indices makes the most sense. So in a simple model like what I had in my book, I just said, okay, let's keep it real simple and just say, should we be in U.S. stocks or non-U.S. stocks? And we use momentum to determine that, whichever has been stronger over the past year. 
So we'll be in either the S&P 500 if the U.S. market has been stronger. And if not, we'll be in uh, the All Country World Index, XUS, one of the ETFs uh, pertaining to that. So that's and basically you- it. We're in either U.S. stocks, non-U.S. stocks, or short-term inter- intermediate-term fixed income, depending on both absolute and relative momentum. And I know you've done a lot of work on this model since the book, and you, you've created this advanced global equities momentum model. Can you just talk about some of the criteria in there, some of the additions you've made since the original model? Well, one thing is we don't just go into one ETF at a time. We're usually in three. So we have a, a, a aggressive module and a less aggressive module. Aggressive module is mostly stock uh, st- stock index ETFs, and the not the less aggressive would be fixed income, although uh, managed futures, commodities, and things like that can fit into either one. Uh, The main difference is we're not limited to monthly data, which is what most people use when they, uh, because the data goes back a long ways monthly. So you can can do some good um, back testing and validation. But uh, to be more sensitive to what's going in the market, uh, it's better to have uh, weekly or daily data. So that's what I use for the advanced model. And that allows us to rebalance more frequently. Uh, we also look at other things, like I mentioned, than uh, just absolute momentum for determining trend. So we'll look at things like market structure and intermarket relationships to determine, help determine whether the primary trend of the stock market is positive or not. Um, and then finally, we have a little bit of mean reversion in there which uh, keeps us from buying when markets are overbought. And uh, uh, all, all of that kind of is, is synergistic and uh, takes everything to a, new, uh, a higher level. So, so with the daily data, you have found that the ability to react more quickly does enhance returns over time versus using monthly or something longer term? Well, it does, but you, uh, you can't be uh, knocked around by noise. So, you ha- I mean, having it available doesn't mean you're going to uh, respond that quickly. I mean, some things like a major ch- tra- change in the trend of the market based on uh, some of these other factors, yeah, we'll take that the day it occurs. But uh, otherwise, you know, we, we just determine what the optimal rebalancing period is. It's, uh, it's less than one month but it's certainly greater than one day or one week. And does that, does that optimal rebalancing period, like as, as you look at different assets and different asset classes, does that vary a lot? Um, or is that something you see is somewhat consistent? It's pretty consistent. Yeah, we've looked at it. We've, we've seen if, uh, you know, maybe uh, we should do it differently. Now, we, I do have another model that uh, doesn't do the same thing. It, uh, we can talk about that. I have, you know, two other models that do things a little differently. One of them just uses monthly data. That's the fixed income model because there it's not so important as with equities. Um, Monthly rebalancing is just fine for that. That's actually where I was going to go next uh, because it's interesting. You know, you don't see tons of people applying momentum to bonds, but it's actually a really interesting area, I think, to do it. Um, So can you talk a little bit about the bond model at a high level, like what it does, what it's trying to accomplish, et cetera? It's doing the same thing. It's using dual momentum, which is trend and relative strength, to short and intermediate uh, term sectors of the bond market. We, we don't need to mess with uh, long-term bonds. Um, it's just uh, we take on more risk than we get in return if we try to do that. So th- there's plenty of uh, areas of the bond market that we can apply dual momentum to. And it's been uh, enormously successful. Uh, I haven't gotten much interest in that model, and I don't know why. Uh, since 1970, it's had a compound annual growth rate of 11% with a standard deviation of around 5%. So that's stock market type return with a third of the volatility. Um, and it's, it's a terrific model, plus it's uh, got very low correlation with uh, our other models and, and with uh, the stock market in general. So have you found like on long-term bonds, have you found momentum doesn't work that well, or have you just found that it introduces too much risk and it's better just to use it on the short and intermediate side? We'll incorporate long-term bonds and in, actually into the equity side of our uh, advanced uh, gem model. But uh, when you're dealing strictly with bonds, you don't need it. And the reason I think has to do with uh, the term structure of uh, 
bonds. And uh, most people use long-term bonds uh, to mac- match up their liabilities. Uh, you know, so if you have a pension fund, let's say, that has liabilities 20 years from now, you can lock in a certainty by having 20-year bonds. Now, if you were to have 10-year bonds instead, you'd have some reinvestment risk 10 years from now. So there has to be a premium you know, in the intermediate bonds because of that reinvestment risk. So if you were to just look at the Sharpe and Sortino ratios of, say, uh, 10-year bonds versus 20-year bonds, you'll find the 10-year bonds have, have better re- reward-to-risk characteristics. So we don't care about uh, reinvestment risk. We're getting in and out based on dual momentum. So we'll take advantage uh, of, of that extra little bit of premium. And in terms of the universe you're applying this to, is it across the bond spectrum? Or maybe you're doing investment grade corporates, high yield, government bonds. Are you covering all that? It's pretty broad. Yeah, we go every from it from T bill, um, floating rate notes, uh, um, you know, uh, high yield, whatever. Uh, it's we have a, a number of different categories that we look at for that. And when you, when you look at like the return benefits of this, is it you know, I know when you, and you may disagree with me this, but sometimes when you look at like trend following on equities, you find that you get sort of a comparable long-term return, but you have way less drawdowns. Like, is that kind of the way it works in bonds too? Um, do you get like a comparable return to the bond market long-term, but you're cutting off the tails? Is that kind of the idea? Well, you you get a lot of the benefit from cutting off the, the left tail, but uh, also the rotational aspect uh, adds return as well by just... Uh, it's like being on a, a train and a faster train comes along, you hop on that. And then another train comes along, you hop on that. So you're always uh, going for your higher return. And uh, momentum works that way, applied to bonds as well as uh, the stock indices. The third model you use is really interesting to me because you're combining a lot of stuff together here. You're combining trend following, you're combining mean reversion, and you're also looking at some breadth indicators, which I, I don't believe were present in the other models. Can you sort of talk about the idea of how, of how this NASDAQ model all comes together into a model? Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of uh, interesting how it all evolves. You know, the, the advanced uh, GEM model, uh, I mentioned, you know, incorporated a bunch of different things. And then I kept looking, you know, are there other exogenous uh, things that might be helpful? And uh, I stumbled across breath. And um, what I like about it is that, you know, just like um, market structure and intermarket relations, you know, that's like Dow theory. It goes back to the early 1900s. Well, breadth goes back a long ways too. People don't talk about it much, be, um, because, probably because they've been using it successfully. And there's no reason to talk about it. But uh, it's been used and respected for a long time. Um, and I came across a research paper that actually did a study of it uh, showing that um, – it has incremental value that you don't get from trend or momentum. So I thought, well, is there some way to integrate that together? And, and I did. Uh, basically, I, I match up uh, the best trend indicator I could find. Uh, this is one that uh, works across all different markets that I've looked at, all different time frames. It has a single parameter that doesn't ever need to be changed. It works the same way on everything. It's fairly short term. And I match that up with breadth. And when they both agree, then we put on a position. And when they both disagree, then we get out. So that's basically it. And when we're out, uh, we default to the advanced uh, GEM model. So uh, it's like having three three models in in one because... uh, well, two models in the sense with that. But I, I usually suggest that people mix that model with uh, our fixed income model because the correlation is so low. It's uh, like 0.18. Uh, so that's the, that's the barbell approach that um, I talk about. Uh, Nassim Taleb came up with that. It's kind of a, a really neat idea is uh, you take a high-risk type investment and a low-risk one, and assuming the correlation is very low, you can add some value that way, not just from rebalancing, but uh, because you can be more aggressive by having that uh, low-risk, non-correlated approach in with it. So that's the reason that we're able to use uh, uh, 
uh, a two X leveraged uh, ETF on the NASDAQ uh, model. Uh, we're very selective about it. You know, it only kicks in uh, about half the time. Uh, otherwise, we default, as I mentioned, to the uh, advanced gem model. But uh, when everything lines up right, then we can be in QLD. Um, and that's worked out beautifully. And you don't do any shorting here, right? So when you're when you're out, you're basically in some sort of lower risk asset with all these models. You're not doing any shorting anywhere? No, uh, we don't short because... Uh, uh, those those short moves or bear markets don't last long enough. By the time you get in and get out with the lags involved, you're better off just uh, rotating into something else. And how do you think about combining these together? So you've got your standard model, you've got your NASDAQ model, you've got your bond model. When you build your overall portfolio, how do you think about the idea of weighting them, how you would weight them across your portfolio? Well, I have fact sheets that have that show different allocations. So uh, like with my advanced gem model, I, sh I show not only it alone, which is, you know, has like a 20% yeah. CAGR uh, going back uh, to when it started. Uh, but I show what happens if you do 50-50 with that and the uh, uh, fixed income model or you do 70-30. And then for the NASDAQ model, I do the same thing. I show uh, several allocations with all three models together. And then I show allocations with uh, more of a pure barbell having just the fixed income model and the NASDAQ model. And I go everywhere from, from 70, 30, one way to 30, 70, you know, the other way. And people can pick and choose, you know, whatever uh, their comfort level is, uh, whatever suits their risk preferences. How do you think about that for your personal portfolio, all the different options? I mean, do you, do you vary that over time or do you have one model you might overweight relative to the others? Or how do you think about that? Um, I've been in the barbell approach, the pure barbell approach. Um, and I started out like 50, 50, uh, fixed income and, uh, and NASDAQ. And, um, now it's up to about 60, 40 from appreciation. I'm, I'm letting it, you know, increase. And as I accumulate, you know, profits, I, I'm getting more comfortable with being more aggressive. Um, and that's what I, I suggest that people do in order to manage the, uh, the psychological exposure is, uh, you know, st start fairly at, at a lower level than you might ultimately want to be at, and then wait until you get some a cushion of accumulated profits to get more aggressive. Um, and uh, at some point, you know, I'll just rebalance at a certain level because there's there's benefits to rebalancing then because you're you're pulling away you're taking profits when you have run-ups and then it, when you have dips, you're, you're adding to the risky part. So that that's helpful. There, there are, uh, rebalancing can, can add some value over time. Too. Do you consider taxes at all when you build the models? I mean, one of the criticisms of momentum is that it does have, tend to have turnover, which generates some taxes. So do you consider that at all when you build the models, trying to limit turnover in certain ways due to taxes, or do you just not consider it? Well, the, the main criticism for momentum and taxes has to do when you use stocks, because every time you rebalance, you can turn over 30% of your portfolio there and stocks have bid ass, high bid ass spreads, you know, so there's transaction costs and there's a lot of in and out. We don't trade that frequently because we're dealing with a, you know, broad market ETFs uh, for the most part. Um, and another thing people don't consider is that since 1930, 40% uh, of the return from the S&P 500 index has come from dividends. So there's no way to get around that, whether you're buy and hold or, or you, you trade in and out. People don't consider that. Also, the average holding period for ETF is a little over three years. So all you're doing is deferring your taxes a little bit. You know, uh, I don't mind uh, paying taxes. In fact, I hope I have a lot of taxes to pay. Because that means I'll, I'll have made a ton of money. It's, what really matters is what do you have after taxes? That, that's what I'm concerned about. The other thing, too, is I think this type of strategy would be great for someone's retirement account. I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of investors have 401ks. They roll over to a rollover IRA. Then they can deploy, you know, use, use that capital uh, to deploy the momentum strategy. 
I have all my uh, retirement accounts invested that way. One of the things that um, I want to ask you is, you know, all of these models, they don't always work. Um, and so how do you personally um, adjust your mindset? I mean, you're obvious, a huge believer in momentum. So it might be like you're just steadfastly a believer. And so you're going to stick with the strategy through thick and thin um, during the periods that it, it's not working. But how would you suggest you know, when you, when you talk to investors that are um, looking at this, I mean, what do you say to them in terms of helping them get through those tough periods of performance? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say I'm a true believer in momentum. I'm a believer in whatever works. Um, and, you know, if, if things change, uh, I hopefully I'll change with it. That's how I, I've evolved the models that I have. They don't include just momentum now. Uh, but I think the important thing is to ask if things aren't working uh, up to expectation anymore, to ask why. You know, can you find some reason for that happening? Um, there are people who have invested with my model, uh, in, like in the past before they, uh, you know, we might underperform a benchmark for a year. Every model will have periods of underperformance, no matter how good it is. So they'll see that it's underperformed a benchmark for a year, and they'll say, okay, it doesn't work anymore. I'm gone. I mean, that's one of the biggest mistakes you can make. So what I like to do is say, okay, well, if we've been underperforming, why? And uh, for instance, my public gem model has had periods of underperformance because it's based on two things. One, relative strength between U.S. and non-U.S. stock. Well, if U.S. stocks have dominated the whole time, which they pretty much have, then you're not going to get any uh, added value from that, from relative momentum. And the other is uh, by avoiding severe bear markets. And, you know, we had uh, a very fast one in 2020 that bounced right back. We didn't, we haven't had a 50% type market decline, you know, where we could uh, really show our relative uh, advantage over uh, over other approaches. You know, I'll, I'll, in 2020, I mean, the model did get out. If we had gone down 50%, you know, it would have looked great, but market came right back up. And the S&P 500 has been, was extremely strong during some of that time. So there, there aren't any trend following approaches I know of that are going to beat the yes, the benchmark when that happens when something is extremely uh, abnormally strong, so you just have to ask, you know, what's going on, and uh, if there's some reason why things uh, change, you know, I mean, markets do change over time, uh, but the thing about momentum, which I like especially, is that there's a behavioral basis for it, and uh, you and nature doesn't change very much over time, so. Uh, the basis for momentum is uh, there's an initial underreaction to information, kind of an inertia. Um, and then you also have the disposition effect, tendency for people to want to sell their winners too soon and hold on to their losers too long. Um, that creates a, a headwind. But eventually, you know, things have to catch up. And that's when you get a, these big moves in momentum. And then you have herding kicking in you know, fear of missing out. Everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon. And so the trends continue. So I don't see human nature uh, changing that much. But if it ever does, hopefully uh, we'll be able to tell. Do you think that, I'm thinking of this year, you know, a lot of people were super negative coming into the year, although stocks had a, initially out of the gate, you know, it was a pretty strong market, but then you had the failure of SVB, and First Republic, and then it was all the recession fears again. And, and but now, you know, stocks are up. I mean, maybe even, I don't know, is the SP up almost 20% so far this year or something like that? So it's just what you described of why momentum works. It seems like this year is a good example of that actually taking place in the markets. Yeah. I mean, that's true. You just have the problem is if you're looking at things and being swayed by the news. Um, you know, you, you might not get in very, you know, until after a lot of the move has happened. So, I mean, our models, uh, you know, they didn't do fantastic last year. They all beat their benchmarks, 
uh, you know, we we were we did fine. We preserved capital, um, and then early this year, uh, they started getting on board. And last quarter, uh, the Nasdaq model was up thirty four percent, and HM was up like fourteen, and it's continuing now. So um, everybody's real happy. I had an investor ask me. It was just a couple of days ago. Um, how long they would have to give a model before they would get out of it and not use it anymore in terms of, you know, the a period of time that you would need to have to know that a model is not working or something's broken. I'm just curious, what would you, how would you answer that? Well, first of all, I would say uh, it's dangerous to try to make judgments based on performance. You know, what you really want to do is study, do your homework first and become convinced that what you're doing makes sense. And and then, you know, give it give it at least a full market cycle. Uh, that's what you have to do there. There have been st studies of uh, pension fund consultants. You know, they look at performance over three years and then they advise people to change and switch. And studies have shown that uh the uh, investors would be better not have switched, to have not switched. Or they wouldn't have been any better, better off. So, you know, there's mean reversion taking place. You know, markets rotational. Sometimes models, you know, uh, will go through uh, dull periods too. The uh, important thing is just to understand and, and have a comfort level and confidence in uh, whatever approach that you're using. It sounds like one of the holdings, you do use a leveraged ETF, but just in general, is there any other leverage in the portfolio? And what's your overall view on leverage when in investing? I'd, I'd stay away from it in general. I mean, I use it very selectively. And this was after doing a bunch of research. I had to make sure that there wasn't volatility drag on, you know, on, on a 2x, one that isn't hold, held for enormous uh, long enormously long period of time we don't have volatility drag in fact we have a little bit of positive uh, tracking on that so you have to do do your homework um, and use it very selectively um, I wouldn't apply leverage uh, in general uh, I believe uh, what the philosopher Mike Tyson said that everybody has a plan until they're punched in the face so you may not realize, you know, the kind of emotional response you're going to have. Um, and it's best, there, there's plenty of uh, opportunity, plenty of profit potential out there with, without employing leverage. Can you, uh, can you explain that concept of volatility drag a little more? Because I think that's something a lot of investors don't fully understand, like how important that is. Yeah, a lot of people avoid all uh, leveraged ETFs. There's an aversion to it because they hear that it's just for day traders. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, it tends to be true for the highly leveraged ones like the 3X um, because they rebalance uh, daily. Uh, but for 2X, uh, and if you're not, if your holding period isn't generally over a year, you know, you don't have that volatility drag. They, they'll go up and down with the underlying ab about twice, as, you know, which is what they should do. Um, so, we don't worry about that. We just um, take advantage of that uh, because, you know, our models are, are that responsive. You know, we can, we can, we're not locked in for a day or a week or whatever. We, we respond to whatever the market's doing and uh, we can, we can get in and out um, a lot quicker than uh, most people who are using uh, trend or momentum. So as part of your personal investable assets, you have the capital that you're deploying and you're following with this momentum strategy. Do you do any, uh, do you do other uh, private investing in startups, real estate? What else is in the portfolio for you? Um, nothing. I've got every, all the assets that I want to have are within the models. I mean, we've got managed futures, commodities. We've got all kinds of fixed income vehicles. We've got uh, a lot of different stock uh, indices uh, in there. Um, anything else would just uh, create, create a drag on, and we don't need it. Uh, Warren Buffett said, uh, those who diversify, you know, they don't know what they're doing, basically. You know? So I think he meant over diversify. So we've got plenty of diversification within our models. 
um, we don't need to do anything outside. Of it. And you do nothing in the, there's nothing in the crypto space that you're deploying. I used to back in 2017. And so um, I did, did quite well. Uh, it was a trend following model. And then a couple of years ago, um, I uh, had another model. It was basic trend following. Um, but that was before, you know, I really had uh, AGM the way I wanted it. And before I had my NASDAQ model, which are multidimensional. Uh, with crypto, it was all single dimension, just uh, trend. And uh, uh, this is much, much richer and more robust, having uh, all these different synergistic uh, inputs into what, what we do now. Uh, plus, you know, a lot of the same forces move both. Um, if you look at the correlation between, uh, you know, Bitcoin and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, different st aggressive stock type uh, indices, it's, it's pretty strong. I did a, a couple of blog posts about, about that a, a few years ago. But do you happen to remember the very first stock or investment that you bought? Yes, I do. It was uh, when I was in college, um, my uh, grandfather was getting International Harry Schultz newsletter, which was pretty good. And he would send it to me when he was done with it. And I followed it for a while. And um, it was kind of esoteric. He was in Switzerland and he recommended all these things that nobody here had, had even heard of some, some of those things. So um, he was recommending a company called Sanyo Electric that nobody heard anything knew anything about. And you couldn't buy it in the US. You had to buy it in Japan through a Japanese stockbroker. And where I was living, there happened to be a Japanese stockbroker in Los Angeles. So I took my meager savings, <laughs> excuse me, went down there. And in broken English, he understood what I wanted to do. And I put all my savings, terrible idea to put all your savings in anything. But he um, I bought Sanyo Electric and it went up 40% in the next few months. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that was my first experience. It uh, led me to think that investing was easy. I mean, it can be simple, but it's not easy. Well, you've been investing for a very long time. So can you just speak to the importance of compounding and starting early and staying in, in sort of staying in the game? Yes. Um, I think you just said it, you know, I don't know what else I could say about it. Uh, the power of compounding is incredible. You can look that up uh, on the internet, and see what it, what it can do. So you don't have to earn spectacular returns. What, what you have to do is find something you're comfortable with that you can stay with because uh, the biggest problem is when people get in and then uh, they get uh, impatient or uh, nervous or whatever, and they pull out often at the wrong time. And then uh, they never have uh, the full benefit of uh, what they're doing, you know, working for them. Uh, I think it was Greg Fisher who said, we don't have uh, people with investment problems. We have investments with people problems. So we like to ask uh, all of our guests a standard closing question, and maybe you just answered it. But if you could impart one lesson that you've learned from building your own personal portfolio to the average investor, what would that be? I would say um, do your homework. You know, uh, it always amazes me that people work long and hard to accumulate capital and then put so little time and energy into figuring out what to do with it. And they, they might tend to follow other people or follow crowds or whatever. And often it's the blind leading the blind. So in the fact sheets for my models, I always put references for people to look at the research which they should do. Um, I offer to uh, do demos uh, online to show people uh, on the charts, you know, all the trades that the NASDAQ model has had so they can better understand how the model functions. Um, and um, always happy to talk to people. I send out um, <clears throat> ongoing information to help educate people. Uh, so that would be the big thing is, uh, don't take it lightly, you know, don't just look at performance. I mean, we have great, you know, numbers to look at, but I discourage people from basing what they do on uh, short-term performance, especially short-term performance. 
So try to understand what's going on and uh, go in and, uh, you know, do your own research. That would be and, my advice. And by the way, I just want to say some of the, the um, July newsletter you sent me, like I would encourage anyone and we'll put links to all of Gary's uh, properties and his Twitter handle um, in the show notes, but that July newsletter was excellent. I mean, I would, I would highly encourage people to go sign up for his newsletter because you really did a great job of like curating all this different market data, uh, together. And, um, so yeah, if, I don't know how, if people can sign up for that or if they need to be a subscriber or what, but that was a top notch, uh, newsletter. Thank you, Justin. That, I just send out to send that out to licensees of my models. Okay. Mm -hmm. that the monthly report but they can sign up on my uh, website for uh, blog posts and um, you know contact me for fact sheets and go to my website and and see how the proprietary models have been doing it's great it's great gary thank you very much for joining us on this uh monday or wherever we are in the summer <laughs> tuesday tuesday yeah i'm losing track <laughs> all right thank you thanks for thank asking so such a good question absolutely all right take care Take care. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at PracticalQuant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.